Uh, I want to start, I want to tell you a story. Um, it's a story that, of a man named Chris Gursky. Uh, you probably don't recognize that name. Maybe you are familiar with the story we'll see in some time. But Chris Gursky is an American from Florida. And in 2018, he took a vacation. He decided to go over, overseas to Europe. Uh, he was in Switzerland for his first day of vacation when he decided to go hang gliding. Uh, he decided he wanted to go have the thrill of a lifetime. He wanted to get some amazing views. So he goes to Switzerland to go hang gliding. Hang gliding, you have an instructor with you. You get harnessed up. You, you strap in. They run off from some type of hilly spot. You, you kind of run and you get off this platform and then you start to soar and you fly and it, it seems like the thrill of a lifetime. I will never do it, but it seems nice. Um, it was supposed to be great. It was going to be a, a great time uh, or so he thought. It was thrilling. Uh, you could say that. Uh, they go to take off. He had his harness on, but right as they jump, he realizes my harness is not strapped in. So his instructor is strapped in, but he was not. And so he immediately grasps onto whatever he can. I mean, he has his arm on his instructor's neck. He has his other hand just reaching for about anything. And he would spend the next two and a half minutes holding on for dear life. Uh, he said, uh, he, he survived, he said, I tried, I looked down once and I thought this is how it ends, but I decided I would try to keep calm and hold on for dear life. Does that sound terrible to you, terrifying? Okay, well, I have a video of it because it went viral five years ago, and I want you to watch it. Um, so, how if you don't mind loading that up? Uh, he did say he wanted to go hang gliding again since it ruined his experience. I'm thinking, yeah, probably not. Um, for you and I watching that, that felt like a very long time, didn't it? He was in the air for only two and a half minutes. Uh, but he really was holding on for dear life. I don't know, have you ever felt like Chris... I mean, not suspended up above the earth about to die in that way, but have you ever felt like you're holding on for dear life? Like there is some problem or some pain, in some cases in our world, a persecution that has you, you know, gripping your hands, ringing, just trying with all your might to make it to the finish line, in Chris's case, to make it back to the ground. It may be that you're in a point of life right now where you feel like you're just holding on. I'm trying with all my might to make it through whatever this thing is that, I, that you're dealing with. It might be that there has been a moment in your life where you felt like Chris, you know, one arm, one hand on, and just feels like you're dangling by a string. It may be that you have never felt like you've been there in life, uh, but you, you very well may be. I would say, in fact, as human beings, that's something we probably all experience at some point where we feel like we're just hanging on and we're trying to endure. If, if you find yourself in one of those situations, understand you're not alone. That's part of our experience. But in fact, the Bible talks about holding on. Uh, Peter wrote a letter to a group of Christians who were suffering. Unlike you and I, their suffering really didn't have to do with just health issues or things going on at home. or that They had those already. But their suffering was because of persecution. A persecution that you and I simply cannot relate to in America, and that's a blessing. But that was what they were dealing with. At this time, uh, in the letter of 1 Peter, as Peter writes to these Christians, uh, the emperor of Rome is, is persecuting them. There are stories of Nero taking Christians, tarring them, putting them on a lamppost, lighting them on fire to light up his garden parties. Uh, they're suffering. You have Christians being removed from their home, Christians being imprisoned or murdered. You have Christians who have lost their jobs, who are struggling to support themselves financially. He calls them exiles at the beginning of 1 Peter in one way because this world is not their home, but in another way because they have been just scattered. And his message to them is many things, but if we boiled it down to two words, it might be hold on. Christians, I need you to hold on. And he'll tell them how to hold on. He'll tell them, look, you're in a fiery trial. Don't be surprised that it's come among you. He'll tell them it's better to suffer for doing what is good if it's God's will than to suffer for doing what's evil. We'll have this message over and over again throughout the letter. But he starts the letter by encouraging them. And I think in the first seven verses or first ten verses of 1 Peter, what he's doing is, hey, you're suffering and you're going to suffer. And I need you to hold on. But here's a great reason why you should. And so if you would, look at 1 Peter chapter 1 with me. 
Peter started off this letter by saying this. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a very cheery start to a letter in many ways. It sounds nice and it's positive and it's encouraging until you get to verse 6. You know, hey, in all these things you rejoice, and we're going to talk about these things in a second, but you rejoice, though now for a little while you've been grieved by various trials. You're, you're being tested. You're suffering. You're going through it. Here's the fiery trial. It, it's right there. In the same way that gold is smelted and the impurities from, all, from the heat come out, it's like that's your faith right now. This faith can mature and it can grow to be more perfect, but it's going through the fire right now. You're being tested. Um, we might not relate to, their, relate to their persecution, but we can relate to the suffering. We can relate to our faith being tested in some way. And what he tells them there is you have great reason to rejoice and hold on. And I want to look at that tonight. And if there is really one reason, because that's, that's the point time. There's one reason why you and I should hold on. And it's, it's this. It's because we have a living hope. We have a living hope. Did you see that in verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's His great mercy. It's the wonderful kindness of our Father through Jesus who has caused us to be born again to a living hope. These Christians who might die, he says, you actually have a living hope. That word is interesting, the word hope, because we never use it the way Peter uses it. Or really the way the Bible uses it a lot. Uh, Maybe we, we use hope the way he does when we talk about Scripture, but we don't talk about hope the way he does. For example, when we talk about hope, or at least I do, I hope my team wins the game. I'm not very confident, but I sure hope so. Um, I hope that storm doesn't come this way. Like if you come to Oklahoma and you live here between, what, May through you know, July or August, it's like, I hope that storm doesn't come this way. Typically, what do we think is actually going to happen? It's going to come this way. Um, I hope that person didn't see me in Walmart, that I didn't want them to see me. Uh, I hope. When we use the word hope in our conversations, it's, it's wishful thinking. It's uh, an uncertain desire. It's something we long for that maybe there's a chance for, but we don't think it's assured. We don't think it's certain. But that's not what Peter means by hope here. That's not biblical hope. Um, and, and the reason, and what that does for us, the way we use hope, is it actually makes hope a dangerous thing. You ever felt like that? that it's, it's dangerous to have hope. You know, don't give me hope. Uh, you, you've heard that before. If there's a chance something will work out in our favor, uh, it gives us some hope, but it's dangerous because there's also a chance that you and I can what? Be disappointed. It's like, oh, it could work out the way I want it to, but we also could be disappointed. And sometimes we would rather just avoid hope entirely because that way we won't be disappointed in the end. We just know the outcome and that's what it's going to be. But that's not the hope Peter's talking about because the, the hope that Peter speaks of, the hope that Jesus really gives, it never leaves you disappointed. Never. The hope Jesus gives, it's not an uncertain desire. It's a confident and assured expectation. It's not wishful. It's expected. It's real. It's attainable. It's assured. And in many ways, it's, it's beautiful. This living hope, it, it's not uncertain. It's for sure. You can have it. And he, the message he's starting with to these Christians is you have a living hope. You have something to hold on to. You have something that should push you through these times, that should motivate you to still live by faith despite the fact you're being tested. Listen, for you and I, Christian, there is something ahead of us in our near future that makes this present, even with all of its problems and pain, worth it. 
There is something ahead of us that is better than this life. There is something that whatever we're going through in this life makes living and living by faith worth it. And it's the fact that we have a living hope. You and I have a living hope, something we should hold on, to, hold on to every single day. And notice a few things he says about this living hope. Uh, for one, we received this living hope when we were born again. Same verse in verse 3, if we emphasize a different phrase of it. This Father, you know, blessed be God the Father, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. This being born again is what helped us to receive this living hope. Because of God's great mercy, he's given us this blessing of hope, but it's been caused through being born again. It, it, this is a reference to baptism. Peter's making a reference to the Christian when they uh, became in Christ. This is a moment back, it's a callback to when they were buried in baptism by faith. Uh, it sounds a lot like John chapter 3, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. And he said there, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus would say to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? See, Nicodemus didn't get it. But Jesus would answer him and say, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And now you get all the way to Peter. What's Peter talking about? You've been born again. He's referencing this moment. When we obey the gospel, which there's multiple parts in that, with faith and repentance and there's confession, but when we come out of that water, we are born again. We now grasp this living hope. It's this moment that we now get to receive it and touch it and hold on to it as we walk in this life. Peter would go on to mention this later in this letter. In 1 Peter chapter 3, he'd say, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a tie back. He's talked about you've been born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here he's talking once again. Baptism is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, hey, when you obeyed the gospel, this moment that you became a Christian, which involved your baptism, that's when you received this hope. And from that moment on, you now have something that's better. Like whatever happens to you in, in this life, the worst it gets, that's the worst it's ever going to get. You ever thought about that? The worst thing that ever happens to you in this life will be the worst thing that ever happens to you as a Christian. Because whatever comes next is absolutely better. It's better. Um, if, if we choose to reject the hope that Jesus offers, the worst thing that happens to us in this life is actually not the worst thing that will ever happen to us. We have something that makes this life worth living. And he says, you were born again into this living hope. Um, and he's urging them, hey, hold on. Remember that commitment you made. Remember that choice you made. Stick to it. And he goes on to talk more about it. Emphasize another part of that verse. He would say, okay, you've been born again to this living hope. But also, your living hope is because of Jesus' resurrection. It is because of Jesus' resurrection. Sure, you did this, and this is how God caused you to have this hope. But it is only through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that you can have living hope. If there is no resurrection, there is absolutely no hope. There is no hope. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ has been raised from the dead, this whole thing is pointless. Why are we talking about it? What's the message for why believe it? Why live by it? Why have this lifestyle? It is pointless to live by faith if Jesus was not raised from the dead. He would go on to say in verse 17 through 19 of the same chapter, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It does you no good. And he would say, and you are still in your sins. If Christ is not raised from the dead, hey, it's great he died and all, but your sins are still upon you and there is no real sacrifice for you. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all those who have fallen asleep, well, they've perished. And if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Just shame. If there is no resurrection, I, feel, I just feel sad for you Christians. Because you have hope in this life, but that's it. Because after, there's just nothing for you. It doesn't get any better. If there's no resurrection, then this life is it. 
All we have is this temporary moment. If there's no resurrection, faith is pointless. If there's no resurrection, there's no reason to follow Jesus' words, to pursue holiness. You'd still be in your sins anyway. If there's no resurrection, we should be pitied because we die without any hope. None whatsoever. Why hold on to your faith? I mean, that's a sad state. That's a sad story. Well, he'll tell you why. Because in verse 20, he would say, but in fact, Christ has been raised. But he has been raised from the dead. He has resurrected. That tomb was empty. Uh, he, he is not dead. Uh, we have something after this life because Jesus surely is alive. We do not serve a dead God, but a living God. Uh, this life is not it. Sin has been defeated. Death is not final. Death is not fatal. There is something awaiting you and I after this life that is better. It is better. The resurrection of Jesus has caused and created something worth holding on for. It's only through the resurrection of Jesus. I know we love to emphasize the death, but we should also emphasize the resurrection. Equally as important. It's what gives us hope. Without it, there is none. And this hope is worth it because uh, look how he describes it in the next verse in your, in your text. This living hope that, that was through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, he says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Uh, Peter says, Christian, you have something better. It's an inheritance. It's a gift from your father. It's a gift from your father waiting for you after this life. And notice how he describes it, those three words. It's imperishable. It will never corrupt. It will never decay. It will never die. I, think about your food pantry and your refrigerators. I would imagine almost everything in there has an expiration date, doesn't it? Don't you love spoiled milk? Mm, like, what a gift. I'm sure... You, from time to time, have to go clean that out, and you like pull out something, and you're just like, how is, is this thing a living thing now? It's been here so long. My first youth ministry work, I, I was in Elk City, and um, they had this youth building room, and they had not really looked in the kitchen for some time. I, I found a can of like chili beans from 2007. It's like that thing had been there 10 years past its expiration date, and I was like, this thing might cause a zombie outbreak. It, it's... It is perishable. He says this inheritance, this gift in heaven waiting for you, it's, it's imperishable. It will never die. It will always be brand new. It will be at its highest quality. It will never lose its effectiveness. Notice the second word he says. It's undefiled. It's not stained. It's not soiled. It's not polluted. It's not impure. I think about our building. We put a new carpet down. New carpet's beautiful. It's a blessing. But what happens right after you put a new carpet down? Gets dirty. Any of you, anybody that has dogs knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's like you clean it, you have a nice carpet, and immediately it just soiled. It just gets dirty. It loses its, its beauty. It, it, it gets defiled. It, he says, Heaven will never be stained, polluted, or corrupted. It'll never be impure. Heaven will never have any stains. Sin will never touch it. It'll be in pristine condition. Then he goes on to say, It's unfading. It will never lose its beauty. It will never lose its luster. When you buy flowers, how long does it take for those flowers to start drooping over, start wilting? You know, they're pretty for a time, but you got to take care of them, and you can take care of them really well, but eventually those flowers, and they start to die. He says, heaven is not like that. What awaits us in eternity, this gift of heaven, it will never lose its beauty. It's, it's sometimes hard for us to understand what heaven's going to be like. God describes it in ways and words that we can picture it in our human minds, but we have no earthly idea what it's going to be like. But we can understand this. It's absolutely worth it. If, I would imagine if you took your favorite place, your favorite view, your favorite activity, your favorite people, all your favorite feelings you get from those things, if you combined it all into one, it wouldn't compare to the greatness of what we have waiting for us in heaven. Amen. And it will never lose its beauty or effectiveness. What God has prepared for us will be that way forever. It's worth it. It is worth it. And so 
as he talks to these Christians, hey, you're suffering, it's coming, it's happening. Uh, he doesn't mince words about it. It's, it's real, you're being tested. Um, but remember what you have waiting for you. You have a living hope because, because Jesus is living, your hope is living. And you have something waiting for you that is beyond description. It is fantastic. And he says, is holding on really worth whatever comes next? He says, yes, it is. Is holding on worth them killing me? Yes. And living by faith? Yes. Is, is holding on worth suffering and, and losing my job and still living by faith? Yes. You know, for us, is suffering worth the health issues we have to keep trusting despite what happen, what's happening in our bodies? Yes. Is suffering worth, uh, is it worth suffering for what's coming next when that temptation is so overwhelming? Yes. Is it worth living by faith in a world that mocks you and makes fun of you for how you live? Yes. We can go down the list with any situation that causes us pain and problems and suffering. And if we ask the question, is, is living by faith really worth it? The answer is always the same. Absolutely. And Peter's message is this. Hey, hold on. Hold on. Don't let go. Can you imagine how sweaty Chris's hands were on that video? I don't know if he chalked up before he got on there, but he should have. Um, I bet he was slipping. But yeah, he found the strength to hold on. I, I'm sure that two and a half minutes for Chris felt like an eternity. In the moment, I'm sure it felt like an eternity. But how long was it? It's only two and a half minutes. Guys, you sit through sermons like 20 times that long every week. <laughs> Maybe 30, depending on who's speaking. <laughs> John. Um, <laughs> it's only two and a half minutes. You know, he kind of makes this point too. Whatever you go through on this life, it's, it's temporary. Some of our suffering is longer. You know, sometimes our suffering is some months. Sometimes it's a year. It's a season. Sometimes it starts and it goes until the end of our life. But notice what he said there in chapter 1. If, if we back it up just a bit. In this you rejoice, though now for a... Uh, in verse 6, he says, a little while. He calls their test just a little while. You know, if, if you were being threatened with your life, do you think you'd call it a little while? Or if you were dealing with that for a year, would you think that was just a short amount of time? Yet when Peter writes about it, he says, it's only a little while. It might feel like our suffering is very long, and I'm not trying to minimize our pain or our problems, but understand it's only a little while. In comparison to what's coming next, it's short. This life's but a vapor. In some ways, our problems are too. They're just here for a little while, but what's coming next is eternal. He'll say in verse 5 that this hope will be revealed. This salvation's ready to be revealed in the last time. Understand, Jesus, Jesus has something waiting that He will reveal. And in verse 7, he's, He tells us He will come back. It will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He will return. The dead in Christ will rise. He will perfect you through His Spirit for this body that will be perfect. You will have a new home forever. When Jesus comes back, all of the suffering will be made right and it will be worth it. And so what's the message for you and I? It's two words. What is it? Tonight, if you are suffering, if you have pain or problems that you're struggling with, I just want to encourage you tonight. You're not alone. There are so many people of faith who have walked that walk. Hold on. It might be you've gotten through it. You've held on. Hey, when it comes again, you've seen you can, you can muscle through it. Hold on again. It may be tonight you haven't been through that. Hey, if, when that comes in your life, hold on. It's absolutely worth it. You and I have a living hope. We have something better that's alive and real because our God is alive and real. Tonight, if we can encourage you, and maybe you're going through something, if we can pray with you, if we can go to our Father on your behalf just to encourage you in the trials that you have, we would love to. Uh, tonight, if it happens to be the case that you've never been born again, that you don't have that living hope, you don't have that assured expectation of what comes after this life to look forward to, um, we would love to help you put on Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism so that you can live with a hope that no one can take away from you. If you have a need tonight, come now while we stand and while we sing.